Uh, I would like to say thank you, welcome to all of you, and we are very happy to see you, and we're also very happy to present our speaker this evening, Jim Gitz. Okay, as I was saying, uh, back by popular demand, uh, Jim, that's what happens when you do such a good job the first time, you get asked back. So, as a brief introduction to our speaker this evening, probably most of you know that Jim is a native of Freeport and a graduate of Freeport High School. He earned his bachelor's degree in economics from the University of Illinois in Springfield and his Juris Doctor degree from Northwestern University Law School. He was our Illinois State Senator of the 35th Congressional District from 1979 through 83, during which time he supported and co-sponsored more than 25 measures that became law. He received awards from the Illinois Taxpayers Association, the Illinois Environmental Council, and the Illinois Education Association. And he was also a speaker on environmental cleanup efforts at several national symposiums. He was, there's more, he was a litigation attorney in Chicago for two large firms from 85 through 93 and the city attorney for Urbana, Illinois, 2005 to 2008. Jim was mayor of Freeport, as you all know, for 12 years, first being elected in 1997. He facilitated the building of this beautiful new library and the current city hall. He pushed for investments in infrastructure and brownfields cleanup, local and regional trail system, community policing, and making our city safer. Jim is currently practicing law in Freeport and Northwest Illinois and he is active in Noon Kiwanis and is currently serving as president. And on a personal note, I learned that he and his wife, Pat, love good books, good wine, and documentaries on Netflix. I, su <laughs> I support all of those. And even more important, they have three shelter dogs, yay. And he is a long-suffering Bears fan. So with that brief introduction, Mr. Jim Gitz. Well, thank you for that fine introduction. It's lengthy enough that maybe we should just stop there. <laughs> There's a, a couple of people I'd like to introduce um, at the beginning, if you don't mind. Um, one of them is my uh, long-suffering wife, uh, Pat, in the back. Um, Pat used to be an executive in fundraising for the American Heart Association. She has the luxury of being uh, retired and she has been firmly urging me to do the same. I guess so that we can drink more good wine, go to documentaries and attend more festivals. <clears throat> um, at any rate, uh, thank you for the privilege of um, this presentation. I also uh, want to recognize uh, Juliet Madero, who uh, was kind enough to help me put together the PowerPoint presentation. I remember uh, when I was leaving the mayor's office, uh, a local attorney of some renown uh, met with me uh, to congratulate me on my wise decision. Um, and I said, do you have any advice uh, to me as an attorney? He said, yes, make technology your friend. I regret to tell you that I'm still working on it. <laughs> um, another person that I want to recognize because I understand it might be his birthday today, Andy Dvorak, a good friend of mine. Andy and I have been known to uh, drink a beer or two at uh, Generations, maybe a couple. And uh, it's always interesting in conversation because Andy uh, is my source of the latest political and history books of some right now. So thank you, Andy. Um, <clears throat> and uh, finally, I want to recognize a, a colleague of mine, uh, Carla Neiman. And uh, Carla is a, a candidate for circuit judge. All right. She didn't ask me to say that, I just chose to do so. <laughs> uh, 
Um, actually, uh, we also have with us tonight another colleague of mine, Bridget uh, Trainer. Um, that's her maiden name. Uh, I got to know Bridget a lot uh, through her father, her, for her father uh, Neil, who is our next door neighbor. And Bridget, we certainly need to talk to your dad soon about a number of projects. <laughs> Tonight we're, uh, we're gathered to talk about an upcoming referendum that seems to be flying under the radar uh, called Home Rule. So the first thing I would like to do um, is to answer the question, what exactly is Home Rule? Um, it's a little hard to see the screen. Home Rule boils down to this. It is the power of local governments to pass their own laws and ordinances and to make their own financial decisions subject to the Illinois Constitution of 1970 and subject to General Assembly action. The premise is giving local governments the authority to create local solutions to local problems. Now that leads me to the next slide, which is um, basically uh, what is the source of this power? Um, this is the Illinois Constitution of 1970 um, changed uh, the Constitution to allow for home rule. But what exactly is the source of that power? We're going to talk about that in a moment. But prior to the Constitution of 1970, um, some 36 states um, had in practice Dillon's Rule, which was named after a prominent Illinois, uh, Iowa Supreme Court judge in the 19th century. Uh, the quote in, from this case was, local governments possess only those powers specifically delegated to them by state law or fairly implied from expressly granted powers. What this meant is that um, all local governments and all other commissions supported thereby were essentially subdivisions um, of delegated power from the state government. So the state government is the source of all sovereignty and sovereignty is defined as the absolute power of command. So, uh, in all of these states of the United States, uh, that is where primary sovereignty lies. Uh, the federal government is an outgrowth of the states getting together and creating the federal constitution. Uh, local governments were originally under the constitution of 1870, uh, very limited in their powers. And the reason that the Illinois Constitution 1970 came into being is because the original uh, 19th century constitution uh, had severe limitations on indebtedness and the ability of local communities to grow. And so there was a national movement to give local governments more flexibility, more power. And the argument, obviously, is pretty much this. Um, a, a city the size of Rockford or Peoria or Chicago is run differently and has more complexity than a small village, let's say like Lena or Shannon or German Valley. And to say that all of them have to operate by the same statutes is to deny that there are significant differences between them. So in 1970 Constitution, um, Louis Ansel, who was the founder of a law firm that I had the privilege of working for for a while, and many of his colleagues uh, lobbied and were part of the CONCON -Con Convention that added an Article 7, Section 6. And I'm going to read to you the first part of this because it will become pretty clear what it says and what it means. A county which has a chief executive officer elected by the electors of the county and any municipality which has a population of more than 25,000 are home rule units. Other municipalities may elect by referendum to become home rule units. Except as limited by this section, a home rule unit may exercise any power and perform any function pertaining to its government and affairs, including but not limited to the power to regulate for the protection of the public health, life, safety, morals, and welfare, to license, to tax, to incur debt. Now, there are other provisions in that section, uh, but they're rather lengthy, not necessarily the most relevant part of our conversation tonight. So this is the source of home rule, the Constitution 1970, Article 6, and primarily A. Um, while we're at this, I, I want to uh, talk about um, uh, the city of Freeport. We became uh, a home rule unit pursuant to this, and uh, we became effective on July 1st of 1971. So home rule uh, was not something that Freeport passed by referendum. It was not something that uh, was created out of whole 
uh, thin air or whole cloth. It was a power granted to us because of the nature of our population at that time. And I might add while we're on this, that um, the 50 years that this has been in effect, the city has been rather judicious in its use of home rule. Um, we've used it in selective instances that we're gonna discuss a little bit tonight, which has created some of the dilemmas that may be um, rather challenging if it's repealed. So one of the questions I want to answer is that, is home rule power of a local government unlimited? There are those who would have you to believe that municipalities can do anything they want. They can have any uh, limit of debt they want. Um, they can uh, pass anything they want and be as reckless as they want. Uh, actually, that's not true, and here's why. First, um, the Constitution of 1970 doesn't say they can do everything. It says they can do certain things. They can license, they can tax, they can pass ordinances. But those ordinances that they approve also are subject to general assembly oversight. And frequently, when I was a, a very young, uh, wet behind the ears state senator, um, you know, there were bills that would have uh, whether it preempted home rule or not. And if it was going to preempt home rule and it was a local government matter, it would have to be approved by a three-fifths majority, and it had to be an express presumption. So I remember that uh, sometime, I believe in the 1990s, there was a suburb in Chicago that wanted to regulate uh, guns, and they wanted to go beyond the state legislature's authority. Um, they passed their home rule ordinance. It wasn't very long after that, the Illinois General Assembly said, no, no, you're not gonna be able to have your own gun legislation. We believe it is important for us to have a uniform set of standards throughout the state. I'm using it as one example. There are hundreds of examples. <clears throat> uh, I also remember, uh, as a young lawyer, uh, looking at environmental protection uh, cases, and there was a major Illinois Supreme Court case, and the question was whether municipalities could essentially have their own Environmental Protection Act regulations. And the court said no. Now, uh, the Illinois Environmental Protection Act stands alone, preempts everyone else in this field, and once again, it will be a uniform set of rules that apply. So I'm using those as illustrations to say that home rule is not unlimited. It is a select created entity um, by the uh, Constitution of 1970 that has been subject to now 50 years of experience um, court interpretation and legislative action by the General Assembly, and it continues to evolve. It's sort of like a growing entity. <clears throat> so uh, I think the next question uh, we have is, why is the city of Freeport's home rule power in the November 22nd uh, general election ballot? Um, as the slide indicates, the city's population has fallen below 25,000. Not by a lot, but by some. And it doesn't matter whether it's by one or a thousand. Um, when you fall below 25,000, um, you automatically face a referendum at the next general election as to whether home rule will be retained. And it's a general election that is specific, specified, uh, not the primary election. And by the way, uh, just so you know, we're not the only ones in this uh, trick box. Um, we are uh, joined by other municipalities that have experienced a, a similar decline in population. Uh, one of them is Carbondale, the home of uh, Southern Illinois University, which kind of surprises me. You would think with the volume of the university and the growth of it uh, that they wouldn't fall into that, but they have. So um, how long has Freeport had home rule? Well, we kind of covered that. Uh, we've had it automatically. We've had it since July 1st, 1971. Um, next. Um, what are some of the preport powers that depend on home rule? Now, I'm going to give you some examples. This is not an all-encompassing uh, selection, but these are some that have come to mind, and I've taken the time to also have a conversation with the city manager uh, to make sure that well, some of these are still in effect. One of them is um, the city has its own uh, fast track demolition for homes that are really in bad shape and need to be taken down immediately. And if necessary, we don't have to go through months and in some cases uh, up to a year or more uh, through the court system to get the property down. We can do that on an expedited basis 
uh, and we can do it with notice to the would-be owners or if it doesn't have an owner, and we can do it quickly. Um, that power is not in state statute. That power is local. Another example is, is that uh, you may recall that in 2013, the city passed an ordinance um, which required registration of certain kinds of rental property. It also established a fee. It also had provisions about uh, an ordinance provision that said your leases will automatically have within it a no drug policy and a no trespass, meaning that if you have drug dealing going on, you can say to the landlord, you have to get rid of this person. Um, that ordinance has been subsequently amended by the uh, local uh, city council uh, but it was wide-ranging. It was based upon Hoffman Estates and some of the things we'd learned from them. Uh, Rockford tried to do this, but they can't do it, uh, at least the fees and fines part of it, um, because they don't have home rule. And in fact, Rockford, if I might take a moment to digress, is an interesting case example. You know, they, they automatically, because of their city size, had home rule uh, in 1971. Uh, but by the early 1980s, they were facing a referendum to repeal Home Rule because the following happened. Um, there was a referendum to build what is now known as the Rockford Civic Center, and the public voted it down. Uh, then they had another maneuver to try to build the same center by other action, and that also failed. Then they went to uh, the creation, either had a building commission or they created a building commission, and the building commission became the builder of the Metro Center. And the public did not seem to embrace this, and they were rather angry that the financing of this was not subject to voter approval. And they voted out the whole home rule issue. And I remember vividly lots of changes that were going on in General Assembly laws uh, to try to provide that the second largest city in the state was gonna be able to function. Uh, without the necessity of home rule. They recently had another referendum and it also uh, failed. That doesn't mean that home rule is uh, repealed across the board. It's just been a very uh, unusual situation. But the lesson that I think most Illinois municipalities have taken from that example is be judicious and careful about the use of home rule or else you will find yourself uh, in one heck of a bind. So. Other uh, examples, there are a lot of local taxes, and I'm gonna list these uh, subsequently in a slide, that are home rule based. <clears throat> and uh, one of the reasons for these local taxes that some people dislike intensely um, is to try to relieve the property tax burden. So these local taxes are used to offset uh, property tax levies. And I'm going to give you a very personal example in a moment. And finally, there are routine decisions um, that we don't think about very much um, in the home rule, but they're there. And an example is, is that um, the city can set its own speed limits and arteries through the city pursuant to its home rule power. Without it, we have to go to IDOT every time we want to make an adjustment. Now, IDOT is a fine organization, but I don't think they want to spend most of their time reviewing speed limits and stop signs in cities. Uh, I'm not saying they have to do that in every situation, but I'm saying that it is there. And um, if you want to put in a street light, you still have to talk to them and have the right information. But there's this delicate balance that goes back and forth. And so uh, if you get the idea that home rule kind of pervades the whole city code, yes, it does. As a matter of fact, if you go through the city ordinances, most of them have a provision that says, we're passing this ordinance, even if it has a state statutory basis, pursuant to our home rule power. So let's talk about something that is clearly a, a very big interest, and that is taxes. The taxes that have been passed with this ominous use of home rule power. Can we pull those up? Now these figures, by the way, uh, come from the city itself. Um, I quoted them directly. I went back and checked it to make sure I believe I have accurate numbers. Um, first, there is a home rule sales tax. So you have a statewide uh, sales tax, but local governments are accorded the ability to also levy a local sales tax. And ours presently stands at 1.25%. The revenue is $4 million a year, a substantial part. Now, can the city get by without that um, local sales tax? Kind of. 
Pursuant to referendum, you can levy up to a 1% local sales tax in 0.25 increments um, by referendum. But even then, you're missing another 2.25%. Uh, There's a food and beverage tax uh, that we all pay when we go through McDonald's or elsewhere, pay at the restaurant. A lot of people are not happy about it. It generates $761,000 a year. Um, we, when we go to the gas pump in Freeport, we pay a motor fuel tax of two cents a gallon. Now, that money does not go in the general fund. It goes into a capital improvement fund, which is used for street equipment. Uh, sometimes it is also used to help supplement the fire department, but it's used for the equipment. So when you see the big trucks that are rolling down doing the snow removal, and you know, they're traveling on the streets, this is the funding mechanism that did not exist um, before some of our aldermen, like Ms. Lights and Fi and others, um, put into place so that we had decent equipment. Um, we have a property transfer tax. Nobody likes this one when they go to make a housing transaction. Um, however, this is used for neighborhood rehabilitation. When we don't have a grant that covers uh, some type of approval, we rely on the property transfer tax um, and a source to help provide the match to help do the demolitions. Now, uh, do we do everything for $204,000? No, of course not. But the point is, is these are supplementary. So um, these are a way of substituting and taking some of the relief off of property taxes. Now, I wanted to talk a moment about that because people constantly in this city rightfully say property taxes are high, I can't stand any more. This is my property tax bill and the property I own. Now, I'm not going to talk about the total amount of property tax, but I'm going to talk about something called City Freeport Corporation. And the amount levied is $237.88. That's roughly 10% of the entire property tax bill. Well, yes, it doesn't include the library, which is another $90. The point here is, is that um, we are in an unusual situation locally of our property tax for the city itself um, really doesn't cover a whole lot. It, it might help to cover uh, the, the contributions that we make to the um, retirement funds for police and fire and others, but it doesn't go very far. So when people say, I'm paying all these property taxes and what do I get for it? Well. You get ambulance service, you get police, you get fire, you get your streets plowed. And by the way, in Rockford, they don't plow the alleys, we do. So there's all of these services that are funded through a variety of mechanisms with very little of it coming from property taxes. The unfortunate thing is, is that our education community has to rely on the property taxes because the state of Illinois has increased its contribution to the local school system but not enough to compensate for the property tax load that we pay. So on this particular property tax bill, um, the school district's uh, take is over $1,500. $1,500 versus 127. Now this is not unusual for home rural communities, by the way, because a lot of home rural communities, and there are something like, I think, 146 of them throughout the state, um, they have used home rule to do these very kinds of things. They've used home rule to try to make sure that their property tax burden is lowered. Um, and they have a, there's been surveys done that show that their property tax load tends to be lower, not always in every situation, but tends to be lower than non-home rule communities, which don't have the same tools. So, let's go on to the next slide. When would a defeat of home rule referendum take effect? Um, defeat of home rule will be almost immediate after certification. Um, certification of the election results, the review of them, is usually done from about 14 to 21 days after the election. So this is not a soft landing um, if the referendum were to be negative. This is a hard landing and it's quick. My take is, and I'm not a legal expert on home rule, I've dealt with it as a municipal attorney, uh, but I've never dealt with a situation where all of a sudden you don't have it. Uh, but the take of some legal experts is, is that the moment that this is certified, um, all these taxes are void. They don't exist. 
and so you have to quickly retool and find a new way to do things. Uh, there are others that have a different take on it that maybe you can finish the fiscal year. I'm not sure that there is a resolved situation on that. Well, when I talked to the city manager, he said, well, that's an open question. They're still working on it. What are some of the consequences, regardless of when it takes place, of home rule? So can we pull that up? One, home rule-based taxes would be void. Number two, the city's current budget, and by the way, the city has gone now to a calendar year budget, much like the county, um, would it be immediately effective? Um, can the city operate through the end of its fiscal year? Sure, they can dig into reserves, they can do a lot of different things, they can borrow. But the point is, is that they're gonna be facing immediate decisions um, as to what they're gonna do. The city would have to adopt a 2023 budget that has reflected this new reality. Uh, picture losing 20% of your revenue almost overnight. Because in that previous slide, um, the city has used the figure $4.5 million of revenue. Um, I said, well, your figures say 5.2. Why is there a difference? He said, well, you know, there's been a growth in revenue recently, so the figures are kind of flexible. But the point is, is regardless of what number you use, it's substantial. It's very substantial. And by the way, you know, there are those who seem to think that um, the city of Freeport is rolling in money. Um, those like Pat, and I think Tom Plim, who's with, thank you Tom for being here. Um, I think we all would agree, regardless of our political approach and philosophy, the city has always operated pretty bare bones. It has not had a lot of extra staff. We've never had the police force we'd like to have. We've never had um, a lot of the services that I think would be important to the restoration of our neighborhood. Uh, for a long time, we really didn't have a grant coordinator until we got so many grants that it was ridiculous not to have a grant coordinator. So uh, it's, it's been a pretty lean um, machine that we've had, uh, but we've always strived to use our money effectively uh, during that time. <coughs> And, and by the way, I noticed in the report that was given about the city tonight about the write-off of water and sewer fees, there has been a long-standing battle about the payment of fees. There are those, and I'm not picking on landlords, but there are those of the landlords that say it's between the city and the tenant. There are others that say, if you own the property, you should be responsible for the payment. Uh, this contraction going back and forth has been a long-standing issue. Um, and there are even people that, well, they get their cousin to sign it because they didn't pay the last bill, and when they move to a new one, the city says, wait a minute, you have an old bill. Um, we've uh, deducted from tax returns, uh, the state returns, which may surprise some people when we said, wait a minute, um, you've got a $100 return here, we want that money because you owe water and sewer. Uh, the issue of collecting uh, fees for water and sewer has been longstanding. It's unpleasant to all of us, I think, because you know, if you and I don't pay our water and sewer bill, they will send you a disconnect notice and they will disconnect. And you gotta pay that fee to get back. So how people actually manage to gain the system has always been a mystery to me, uh, but it goes on. Um, but the city, to its credit, has uh, constantly tried to update and find ways to deal with this um, without putting all the load on and responsibility on landlords. So, um, what are some of the other effects here that we have? Service cuts. Uh, can, well, can we go back to that situation for a moment? Um, I think it is inevitable from what I, my discussion with people has been that there would be at least immediate service cuts. And unfortunately, so much of the city's budget goes to public safety. Um, it's hard to envision them being able to not have cuts there as well. And that's because of these local taxes that have been implemented. Some of the uh, average figures I see in property tax load throughout the state is about 30% of the budget. 30% um, of the tax bill goes to the city. So 10% versus 30%. And there's a, there's a hidden landmine in here I'm gonna to come to shortly. So what is the effect of the home rules loss on specific services? Well, um, one of the things that I'm told that the city will consider doing is closing one of the fire stations 
um, and not hiring additional police officers or hiring uh, very few. Um, again, because public safety is such a, a large part of the budget. This is not about punishment. This is not about saying, well, the public didn't vote for this, so we're going to take it out on them. This is the raw reality of saying, how do we keep this corporation that we call the city of Freeport operating? The street department equipment fund would be um, eliminated. So now the city's going to have to figure out a new way to buy equipment. So trucks don't last forever. Um, and neither do police cars, uh, neither do ambulances. Uh, my office is down at, at Park Boulevard in Galena, and I dare say that at least once a day, I see the fire truck and the ambulance going by uh, for some emergency. Um, finally, <coughs> um, what are some of the long-term consequences of home rules uh, power? The city's general obligation bonds are guaranteed by property taxes. Now, let's take a moment and talk about um, general obligation bonds versus revenue bonds. Because if you open up your Illinois compiled statutes, you'll see references to both, pretty much scattered throughout the entire uh, five volume set. By the way, when I was a young legislator, there were three volumes of the Illinois revised statutes. That's what they were called there. And I think there was an index. Now there's five volumes, <laughs> a lot more laws. Um, I think that Carla <clears throat> and uh, all of our attorneys uh, can testify, you know, the, the code on child support used to be, you know, a page long maybe. Now it goes on and on and on for everything. I mean, it's just, it's, some of it is really good um, and it covers just about everything, but it is complicated and it's lengthy. So general obligation bonds are bonds that are issued uh, for a capital improvement project that are guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the city itself. A revenue bond is guaranteed only by a specific revenue stream. So as you might guess, a revenue bond is considered less secure. Therefore, it commands a higher interest rate. So whenever possible, if you're doing a large project, um, you're going to want to use general obligation bonds. The general obligation bonds can be further reduced in secure, or increased in security and therefore an even lower interest rate um, if they are backed by property taxes as well as the full faith and credit of the city. So picture, the city has, according to the information given me, $74.6 million in general obligation bonds, <clears throat> roughly $4.8 million in debt service a year. And some of those bonds, as I recall, go up to close to um, 2046. So these are bonds that have first claim on everything. So it's kind of like uh, you were in your home and you signed this general obligation bond and uh, you have revenue and all of a sudden you don't have as much revenue and the bond holder says, I don't care if your car broke down I don't care if you can pay your mortgage, and I don't care if you can eat. You pay me. You pay me now, and you pay me on time, because I will come into court, and I will use my power to grab your property tax revenue um, to pay this obligation. So that's why general obligation bonds have been a good instrument at a low in rate of interest uh, to pay for capital improvements that we have in the city. And you see the evidence of all the things that are being done around the city. That it does not come solely from a grant. It does not magically appear out of the sky. It is paid for. And each person, as they live here, in a sense makes a contribution on an annual basis to retiring those bonds. So the idea is that people pay for the improvement as they go through life. Um, and the improvement benefits all, as opposed to if we had to wait to uh, till the piggy bank was full to make the improvement, we'd be waiting until 2015. Um, or as the play goes from the 60s, you'd be waiting for Godot, inside joke. So um, these bonds are a very real problem for the city in terms of how to meet the debt service um, if home rule is not sustained. I'm not saying that, you know, woe is me. I'm not saying that a comet is going to magically appear out of the sky and blow everything to kingdom come. 
I'm just simply saying that anybody who's occupying a, a seat in a city council and making decisions for this is going to have some really tough choices to make. Finally, the city will lose its flexibility to spread its revenue needs over a lot of local taxes to keep the property tax low. So we've talked about those numbers. But what are some of the additional um, long-term consequences? The city will have less revenue to address public needs such as enhanced public safety and neighborhood restoration. It will prove difficult to maintain the current level of public services. And that concerns me greatly. There isn't a neighborhood in the city of Freeport that I don't think is exempt from the present climate that we have of crime. Um, it exists in the West End, it exists in the East End, it exists everywhere. We live in strange times. Um, it doesn't mean that things will get steadily worse, it just means it is what it is. I don't know of anybody in their right mind that says we should defund the police. That is a moniker that it is used and batted around politically. I don't care whether you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, I think we all agree. If we have a family emergency, it's nice to have that ambulance show up in about uh, three to five minutes. If we have a fire, it's nice to have a full-time fire department that's been trained to deal with it right now. If we um, have an emergency and somebody is uh, busting the glass out in your house, you want the police to be there and you don't want them to say we're on another call. We'll get to you when we can. So these are very real life situations that depend upon having adequate revenue. Now, there are also those who say, if I might park from away, um, <clears throat> well, let's just pay everybody a lot less. Okay, so Freeport hires policemen and one of their biggest problems, I can testify personally, is retaining good officers. Because they get their training, which we all pay for, and they're paid a decent salary, but not the greatest salary. And then another municipality says, well, we'll give you a bonus for coming here. We'll give you time for your retirement that you had there. And pretty soon you have a retention situation that now everybody is fighting. So I'm just simply saying that as Tom Clem or Pat Lights and Fi or anyone else who has been in the council will tell you, uh, these are real life issues that we all dealt with and we struggle with to do the best that we can with what we've got. <clears throat> so I've been asked to talk about the positives to eliminating home rule. As you can tell, that's a little bit of a mind scratcher for me from my perspective. <clears throat> because I've, I've worked with home rule for a long time. Um, number one, if you like referendums, you'll, you'll love not having home rule. <laughs> <clears throat> and, the, and the best analogy I can think about is this, uh, and I'm not lobbying, I'm not saying referendums are a bad thing. I actually like referendums um, under certain circumstances. Um, but think about the school district. <clears throat> when they're up against the wall uh, for their instruction funds, um, and they can't get any more money because of the way the state aid formula is, they go to referendum. And those referendums, as uh, Pat Norman will be able to tell you, are always hard to pass. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, a funky system, but this is how democracy works. So referendums be required virtually all the time on any kind of tax increase you would have. Doesn't mean that every year you're gonna have a referendum on your property taxes. It means that when you hit the ceiling that has been approved by the voters, you want to change that, if the state will even allow you to change it, you have to go to referendum. The food and uh, beverage tax would disappear. There is no state authority to levy a food and beverage tax that I'm aware of. The property sales tax uh, would also disappear. I, if they have a, a provision that says you can levy it in the state legislation, none of us have been able to locate it. Now there's a general sales tax um, that can be voted on a referendum, but it would have to be reauthorized and it would have to be, in all likelihood, reauthorized in stages. You can't go from zero to a full cent all in one shot. So um, if you want to limit government, um, this is one way to do it. There would be less bonding for public improvements because the impact on bond payments the city's budget. Uh, the city government would be skeletal because there'll be less revenue. There'd probably be less traffic to beat up the streets because I think you'll end up having fewer people. 
in Stevenson County probably would grow at the expense of the city. Um, so what I'm saying here uh, straightforwardly is this. I don't know of any city that has been able to cut its budget and cut its way to <coughs> prosperity. Um, in fact, there's a strange anomaly that some of the most desirable states in terms of services are states that have a fairly substantial tax rate. I think the key is this, and this is where government doesn't necessarily work as well as it should. Um, people don't mind paying taxes, but they expect to get something for their money. If you're going to pay a public service tax um, for safety, like the county levies, you expect that you'll see something tangible coming out of it. So I think sometimes government uh, gets a little sloppy in telling its story and saying, here's what we're going to do with your money. Here's, you know, if you approve this tax, we'll fix your streets. And here's the list of streets that will be, be improved, and here's the order in which they'll be done. There is a lot of skepticism of the public, which we'll talk about in a moment. So there are positives to eliminating um, home rule if you want government to be as limited as possible. <clears throat> There's a, a right-wing think uh, tank guy I saw one time on cable, and he said, my long-term goal is to reduce the size of government so small that I can take it in my bathtub and strangle it. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for. <clears throat> so I've chosen uh, also to talk about um, why this is uh, not more publicized. Um, so I, I want to spend a moment on that before I go to the ballot issue itself. State election law and the election code. I was going to look up the section, but I didn't have time to do this when I was writing it. Uh, but state election law has a provision in it that says in any public referendum, um, the public body is prohibited from taking a position on it or funding any position on it. So the city of Freeport cannot take a position, and I don't think should take a position, on the referendum one way or another. And that's true not just to this referendum, it's any referendum. When there is a city manager referendum, um, we were careful. Uh, we might have a private opinion about it, but uh, and there were people who were for it and against it, but there was not an official position. Because the idea is, is that these referendums should be played on a level playing field. <clears throat> um, but the second part of this on the referendum is, most people, I, I don't think, follow local government very closely. So a lot of Freeport voters don't know that there's a referendum on home rule, let alone what home rule is, what it means to them, what's going to happen. <clears throat> Um, I have also noted here that a lot of Freeport community organizations are strangely disengaged in this issue, even though it, it affects each of us. I think there's a growing awareness on the part of the Chamber and some others um, about this referendum, but a lot of people seem strangely detached. Uh, they kind of have the view, well, this is the city. This is for the city council to figure out. We don't have a horse in this race. Who is the city? It's all of us. It's everybody in this room, and it is all of the people that make up the city, and it actually extends to our children and others who are not yet able to vote because they're the legacy, they're the future. So, you know, this is one of those Rubicon moments, history, Caesar crossing the uh, Rubicon River, which was prohibited by the Roman Senate. This is a Rubicon moment um, after you've passed that, which is going to be a defining moment in this city. Um, so this is at least, at minimum, should be an informed decision for all of us. Um, and finally, uh, I want to talk about the referendum question itself. <coughs> Shall the city of Freeport remain a home rule unit of government? That's the, what will appear on the ballot. That's the exact wording that the council has approved, according to what I was told by the city clerk's office. Um, you know, appear towards the end. I'm sorry? Here's the point about climate. Um, I think we can all agree there's a lot of distrust of government these days. I think we can agree that it is somewhat a poisonous environment, not necessarily in Illinois, 
but in a lot of states, but everywhere there is skepticism. So this bright, the future is our oyster view that many of us grew up with in the 1950s and 60s, I'm dating myself, um, that optimism is under challenge these days. And a lot of people are saying, let me at him. You know, I think that's why uh, Donald Trump got elected president. People said, what we have, we're not happy with. Let's try something different. This guy shoots from the hip. He calls it as he sees it. Maybe it'll get better. Um, I won't go further because I would give away my thoughts. <laughs> I have, I have a, a person, by the way, in my office who falls into that category. Um, we agree on cars. We both like motorcycles. Uh, we both like uh, good wine. Um, po politically, no. And so when he says, Joe Biden's still president, uh, I always retort and say, is Donald Trump in an orange jumpsuit yet? <laughs> and so we banter. Uh, and what is great is we can talk to one another and we can put a lighter touch on it without getting nasty. And I think that um, in these times, whether the issue is home rule or political candidates, or whatever, we need to uh, remember we're all Americans. This country is a republic. Um, a lot of people fought and died for it. And I think we all have a responsibility um, to convey this country to the future generations better than we found it. And so, you know, maybe home rule will be retained and maybe it won't, but we're obligated to move on and live and thrive as best we can um, as a community and as a country. So I've tried to handle uh, an explanation of this issue. I've done it without a lot of legalese and I, I hope it has been somewhat informative. Um, I waited till the end for questions, but if there are some questions or comments that people like to make, um, have a have at it. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Cities that do not have home rule that we compare ourselves against. Um, I don't know of a lot of them because uh, most cities have gone from non-home rule to home rule on these issues. I don't know of uh, referendums that have been approved where people are voluntarily trying to give up home rule once they've achieved it. Um, if you wanted an example that I think is imperfect in its comparison, the city of Rockford um, has functioned without home rule for the last three decades, but it's a large city and it had sufficient gravitas that it could actually go to the General Assembly because they had this uh, local state representative, Zeke Georgie, who just happened to be the majority leader, and he could get a lot of legislation changed to accommodate Rockford's needs. Um, I'm not sure that we have the same firepower. I, I hope that answers your question. Yes? Um, it can come back on the ballot. I don't know if it can come back in two years. I think it can, John, but I'm not 100% sure on that. What I do know is, is, is um, once you've had the referendum um, and it's failed, there is a time limit on bringing it back. Yes? Recently, they had a bunch of properties called donut holes. None of that means. Um, but they didn't annex, there's a subdivision on the north side of Fairgrounds Road by Walmart. That is a donut hole. Would have that annexation of that subdivision given them enough population to keep home without a question? I don't know. I, I, offhand, if, offhand, I kind of doubt it um, by the numbers, uh, but I always have come from a school of thought that every vote counts. Um, for example, I remember, and I was not there at the time, um, there was a real um, conversation going on in another administration about annexing the, the whole subdivision north of the bypass because their water system was defunct. It was a private development 
and they needed to hook on to a system. And the city said, we don't like the numbers, we don't like the cost, we're not gonna do that. I personally thought that that was a dumb decision. Here's why. Number one, once you have crossed the bypass and you've added to the corporate limits of the city, then you have uh, the opportunity to make it easier to develop that whole bypass area. And apparently that was not thought of. And second, you were adding to population. So I'm of the opinion that when there is a need, it's a good idea to annex. Um, I'm personally troubled by forced annexations, and I think most council people say, feel the same way. But donut holes do kind of peculiar. I remember there's one section, I don't know if this has been annexed into the city and the West End. Uh, it's a property that we're all knowing. It's a big circle in the map. One person lives there. He said, I don't want to be in the city. And I said, okay, we're not gonna fight with you about it. Not that big a deal. It's not worth the hassle. Other questions, other comments? Tom, is there anything you'd like to say? Pat? Um, well, I did it with Tom said, and that's exactly why I was here, because I knew that um, well, you and I not, don't always agree. I trust your judgment on this. <coughs> Thank you. Jim, Andy, uh, I'll come to you. Okay. the 5.3 million derived from the home rule taxes, is that in fact 20% of the annual budget? Uh, roughly. That's a rough figure, but um, city, city manager, I think, will tell you 20%. It might be 19, it might be 21, but it's in that vicinity. I think the total city budget is now somewhere around 21 million. But you can pull up the audit on the uh, city website, I was reminded, and you can see the numbers for the year, previous year uh, directly. Somewhere around 20, 21, 22 million, I think. I'm doing that off the top of my head. And by the way, you know, when I walked out of the uh, mayor's office in 2017, voluntarily, I might add, uh, not too many leave <laughs> voluntarily. <laughs> I thought it was time. Uh, my wife will verify I did not tune in to the, all the council meetings. I did not follow everything religiously. I did not come to the council meeting and comment about this ordinance or that ordinance. It's like, I need a break from this. I'm gonna become a good lawyer as best I can. I'll let the city go forward on its own progress call and uh, I'll come back to it at another time. Um, not as a candidate, mind you, but as a citizen. So uh, I don't claim to be an expert on everything that has happened. I wanna make that very clear. And I have, I've checked uh, a lot of the figures in here. Um, if there's an error that's been made, uh, my apologies, but I think it's pretty darn close to accurate. Andy, you had something. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the major reasons why there, there, there are no neighborhood bicycle patrols, for instance, anymore. And that's what's going on. Right. I didn't realize it had gone down to 37. I didn't either. We were adding a couple of officers during the time of mayor. I'm not conversing in everything that happened afterwards. <laughs> Tom. Just going to disappear. It's a matter of where that money is really going to come from. 
And it will affect in the long run, it will affect your real estate tax. Just ask it. Yes. Jim, I got a question about if, if the city can't um, publicize this, that it's a potential, that it's going to be listed on the map, how do we get the word out? Because there's so much misconception at this point that needs to be well, I would dare say uh, this is a great start. And I, I want to express my appreciation to the League tonight uh, for sponsoring uh, this presentation. Um, so this is a start. I would dare say that a lot of the people in this room are members of other organizations. You know, um, Carla and I and Bridget are members of the Noon Kiwanis Club, which, by the way, I'm no longer the president. <laughs> I was term limited there, too. <laughs> Um, you know, we, we all got to do our part. We, we all can uh, put something up on our Facebook. We can all email our friends. We can talk to our organizations. Um, I know there's a, a movement afoot uh, to talk to leading uh, community organizations that are involved in the city's economic development and downtown development to get them involved. Um, there's 60 days to the election, roughly. Um, so a lot has to happen here and somebody needs to grab the bull by the horns and make it happen. I'm not retired, so I'm not a candidate. Um, I'm willing to help, as all of us are, uh, on this effort. But uh, there needs to be a coalition of community organizations who say, the alternative is unacceptable, and so let us all work together. I have a feeling that if this goes south on us, that in very short order, There'll be such draconian results that people will be revisiting this issue and say, well, I didn't know. It's the inverse of a, a, a personal story I'll share with you just for the humor of it. Um, some of us died on the hill of this library. Now, this library was not built with all kinds of extra new taxes. It was not built with um, anything other than a coalition of interest. There's about $2 million of city bonded indebtedness that went into this, which was wrapped with sewer improvements. Um, the library board raised um, about $2.5 million. Um, there was a gift from Newell. Um, there was land donated by, uh, I think, uh, by the previous Ford family. Um, it was a coalition. So it's a $6.5 million library, which is kind of a bargain at the time but it was not a load on every city taxpayer. But I heard all kinds of negativism of why in the world do we have this Taj Mahal in downtown Freeport? Well, look at today. Um, and so one of the people who was my critic at the time came up to me a couple years later when I was city attorney in another community. And he says, you know, I've been to the library and it's pretty doggone nice. I'm glad you got that done. <laughs> So one of the things that I've learned along the way is mayors are always more popular after they've left office. <laughs> yes? Will this video and that slide show be available anywhere that we can bring for our friends and neighbors to? Well, that's up to the uh, League of Women Voters. Um, I'm happy to make uh, my handouts available. I'm happy to cooperate in that. You can use it any way you wish. The only, uh, the only request I'd make is I'd like to not be quoted out of context. <laughs> Are there any other closing thoughts? <clears throat> um, again, in closing, um, thank you for the privilege of uh, being chosen to give this presentation. Um, I hope my law clients, I have a hearing tomorrow in Carroll County at 3 p.m. Um, that I hope to be fully prepared for. I spent a lot of time kind of nailing this together with Juliet's help. How many drafts did we do, Juliet? About four? <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> it was a labor of love, and I hope it's of help. I hope it helps frame the issues. I hope it's of futility. Um, it's a privilege to join you tonight to offer these comments and to look forward to the future. Thank you.